Testament book in the New Testament, we understand, as we've talked about in weeks past, that these psalms explore the depths of the human soul. And they cover the spectrum of the human heart. You have psalms where people are just rejoicing and they're excited and they're just so glad that they can praise God. And then that there are these other psalms where people are in such despair and the author is laying out his soul and saying, God, where are you? God, I need to find you. We truly understand these emotions. And so when we read these psalms, we truly see a reflection of our own hearts as we go throughout our lives, whether we're going through difficult trials or we're going through triumphs. And every single time, whether difficult or in celebration, we ought to turn to God. Whether it's times of, of sorrow and we need strength from God or in times of victory, we need to make sure we thank God for all that He's done for us. So that's what we see in the book of Psalms. We, we see that the book of Psalms really guides us in it, and it shows us how we can properly worship God every single moment of our lives. So far we've covered the 46th Psalm. And in that we talked about stability, no matter what we're facing in our life, that God can bring us a place of refuge, that He is a present help. He is readily available. And then we covered Psalm 19 and we saw a psalm of someone searching and how they look out into the sky and they see the sun and the stars and they say that the heavens declare God, that, that they showcase God's power. And then at the latter part of Psalm 19, we see how the law of the Lord, how it's perfect, how it's good, how it is pure. We see not only the, the titles of God's Word, but the characteristics of God's Word, and then the blessings of one who follows God's Word. And it ends with, let the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable in your sight. O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. We cover last week a psalm of forgiveness. The 32nd Psalm where David is very candid about sin and he expresses what happens when you try to cover up sin. How it affects you. It affects you physically. It affects you emotionally. It affects you spiritually. We saw how David's sin with Bathsheba truly did affect him for nearly the year he tried to cover it up. But not only his adultery, but overall his murdering a close friend of his and a fellow warrior, one of his mighty men. It ate David up inside. To where David said, my vitality has turned into the drought of summer, like it is in the desert. But then he went and he had this contrast between one who hides sin and one who confesses sin and how God becomes a place of safety. In God, we have every reason to rejoice and be glad. So here we are at the end of our series. We're talking about a psalm of rest, the 23rd Psalm. I guarantee you, if I asked for each of you to quote the 23rd Psalm. You could probably get most of it, right? I mean, it's only six verses, and I think most of us have grown up hearing the Psalm. We might go from one translation to another translation, but we get the gist of what is being said in Psalm 23. And you might think to yourself, I thought we already had a Psalm of stability. Well, well yes, Psalm 23 is about stability. But it's also about searching for God. It is also about the feeling of forgiveness. I believe Psalm 23 encapsulates all the other psalms we've covered so far. As I said, Psalm 23 is very well known. It has been called the Psalm of Psalms. It is a psalm for those who are weary. Those, like Jesus described, as He looked out into the crowds and He saw these people like sheep who had no shepherd. And He was moved with compassion in Matthew chapter 9, verse 36. Psalm 23 is about a relationship between the Creator and His creation. It is a very intimate psalm. It is a very personal psalm. It is a very individual psalm. It's one that we can all understand. It's one that covers the life of a person who knows his God, who follows his Lord, and finds joy in his Master's presence. So as we conclude this year and this series, I think it would be great for us to look at the 23rd Psalm together. So let's look together and let's begin with the background. You might be saying, well, why in the world did we turn to 1 Samuel 16 
if we're going to look at the 23rd Psalm? Well, because we do need to establish the background. And we begin with a ruddy young boy. You might think, well, what is this background behind the psalm? Well, the answer is found in the author of the psalm, in David. So here we are at the end of 1 Samuel 15, and, and King Saul, the first king of Israel, has gone against God and disobeyed God for the last time. And God tells him through Samuel, I'm taking the kingdom away from you. And Samuel was never to see Saul again. That's how 1 Samuel 15 ends. In 1 Samuel 16, you see Samuel somewhat lamenting, and God saying, hey, wake up. I have something for you to do. I need you to go to the house of Jesse, and the king that I have chosen will be there. So, of course, Samuel goes, and they have this sacrifice. And then he goes through, and he sees the sons, and we all know the story. He goes up to Eliab, he goes up to the oldest, and he says, you know what? I can't imagine a better king than this boy right here. Well, that's what happened with Saul, and that's how they got in the hot water in the first place. Amen. Saul was a head above everybody else, and he was a good-looking guy. And that's what Samuel's seen. He's looking at the external thinking, this guy, he's, he's who we need. And God says, no. Man looks out at the outward appearance. The Lord looks at the heart. So Samuel goes through each of the seven boys. And by the end of the seventh one, it must be somewhat embarrassing. And Jesse might be somewhat nervous. And I'm sure Samuel's frustrated. He says, I, I can't find anybody. And he turns to Jesse and says, Is, isn't there anyone else? Is there, do you have any more children? Are you hiding someone? And notice here. Notice Jesse's response. In verse 11. Are all your sons here? And he said, well, there remains yet the youngest, but behold, what's he doing? Keeping the sheep. Samuel said to Jesse, send and get him here, for we will not sit down till he comes here. Now notice who was keeping the sheep. Was it the oldest? The one that was trusted the most with, with the most amount of responsibility? No. Was he in the second or the third oldest? In fact, it was the forgotten child. It was the youngest boy. I'm sure each and every one of you remembers your first job. Did it pay well? Did you get good holidays off that first job? I've shared with you some of my first jobs. I, I worked and I picked sweet potatoes and I earned about $20 a day. Uh, then I worked for a, a tube stand that was a, a stand that rented out inner tubes and I'd work out in about 100 degree Florida summer uh, with 100% humidity and we rent out these little inner tubes and I had to tie them onto the car. Oh man, you talk about a job that paid well, that was $5 an hour. That was so much more than my picking sweet potatoes. I mean, your first job, just it was, it's not a glamorous job. If you go out into the corporate setting, you're more likely to work in the mail room than a CEO your first venture out. Here's what we know about shepherds. They're on the lower rung of society. They were not well respected because it was dirty work. It was full-time work. And while it was important work, it was also somewhat shameful work. This is what we see just in the first example of what it means to be a shepherd. Just when we just talk about what it means to be a shepherd, when we see David first introduced, he's this young, ruddy, good-looking kind of boy, and he's tending the sheep. Well, let's look over. Let's fast forward to chapter 17, and let's see a little bit more about what it means to be a shepherd. Because it was a full-time, it was a dirty, it was a difficult job. And it was a job where you could easily lose your life. So we fast forward and we have the Philistines going against the Israelites. We talked about this in Bible class this morning. And they have the Philistines send out their champion. And it's this monster of a man, Goliath. I mean, his body armor alone weighed 125 pounds. And he goes out and he begins to mock the God of the Israelites and begins to mock the Israelites themselves. And meanwhile, the Israelites' knees are knocking together and they cower and they're in fear. And no one, not even good King Saul, who's ahead above everybody else, dares to step out and fight Goliath. For 40 days, Goliath goes in the morning and in the evening. No challenger rises against him until one day this ruddy 
but good looking, shepherd overhears Goliath's taunting. And David cannot stand the fact that no one is willing to do anything about Goliath. And he and his brother soon get in, into an argument and King Saul overhears what David is saying. And so he has David come closer and he wants to hear what David has to say. And you go to verse 32 of chapter 17. And David said to Saul, let no man's heart fail because of him. Your servant will go and fight with this Philistine. Now you imagine a little 16, 17 year old boy saying that against this giant, this athlete, this warrior, you'd probably laugh your head off. And Saul said to David, you are not able to go against this Philistine to fight with him. You are but a youth, and he has been a man of war from his youth. You're a child. You have no experience. You don't know what you're talking about. This guy has been picking fights since he was your age. He has more experience. He has more strength. He has, he has more knowledge. He has more agility. He, he, he'll tear you apart limb from limb. Notice David's response. David said to Saul, your servant used to keep sheep for his father. And when there came a lion or a bear and took a lamb from the flock, I went after him and struck him and delivered it out of his mouth. And if he rose against me, I caught him by his beard and struck him and killed him. Your servant has struck down both lions and bears, and this uncircumcised Philistine shall be like one of them, for he has defied the armies of the living God. And David said, The Lord who delivered me from the paw of the lion and from the paw of the bear will deliver me from the hand of this Philistine. And Saul said to David, Go, and the Lord be with you. I think about David's confidence. This isn't just hubris. This is from a person speaking with experience. Now I want you to imagine there's a lion. And let's say you have some sheep. And the lion takes one of your sheep and begins to run away. Are you going to chase after that thing? Even with a car. Are you going to go after that lion for a little old sheep? What if I just gave you a rifle? Let's say that lion drops the sheep and gives you a look. Are you going to sit there behind your rifle and hope you get a good shot? Or are you going to take off and flee? David didn't have that. He had a sling. He had a rod. He had a staff. And he would chase after those animals. You imagine a great big bear tear you apart instantly. David chased after these dangerous predators. And if they rose against him, he would kill them without a second thought. I want you to have that picture in your mind as we read the 23rd Psalm. Because it is, a, it is a, a, an occupation where if you're not genuine, if you do not have tender care and love and dedication, then you could lose your life. Jesus described the difference between a hireling and a good shepherd. A hireling, when he sees a wolf, according to Jesus in, in John chapter 10, when a hireling sees a wolf, he runs the other way. That's probably what I would do. But a good shepherd risks his life for a sheep. David was a good shepherd. David understood what it took to be a good shepherd. And then he pens the six verse psalm beginning with the Lord is my shepherd let's look at the psalm together psalm 23 I'm sure we could all quote it for the most part the Lord is my shepherd I shall not want he makes me lie down in green pastures he leads me beside still waters he restores my soul he leads me in paths of righteousness for His name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy 
shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Here's some things we can learn from the 23rd Psalm. Let's talk about the Psalm itself. First of all, we learn that He provides. I want you to hear the Psalm of rest, of confidence, of trust. It's a Psalm about a personal relationship with God. I know that because it begins with, the God is my shepherd. My God is my shepherd. No. The Lord is my shepherd. That is the covenant name of God. That's referring to a personal relationship between God and His people. If you just want to talk about the impersonal relationship, you would have used Elohim. You would have used God. But instead, David uses Jehovah. He uses Yahweh. And he says, this God, this Lord, He is whose shepherd? Mine. Something else I love about the 23rd Psalm. It's that God guides me. God protects me. God takes care of me. God comforts me. Yes, God does this for every other person in this world. For those that come to God, yes, God takes care of each and every one of them. But for David, he's reminiscing about how he has this personal, individual relationship with God as if it were only God and him. And you hear how David begins to describe what God does. He says, I shall not want. God is all sufficient. In God, David lacked nothing. David knew the hard work it took to satisfy sheep, and he knew how much sheep needed to be tended. And he's saying, that's exactly what God does for me. And he explains how in the following verses. He says, well, he makes me lie down. Sheep are easily startled. David was often startled. He often went through difficult times. Yet God always brought him to a restful place, lush, full of greenness, full of life. Remember the 46th Psalm. Be still and know that I am God. He leads me beside the still waters. You talk about skittish. If, if that stream was flowing just a little too quick, the sheep would often be too scared to drink, to lap up that water. If they even dared, often they could fall in. And they would just go down the stream and they'd be lost. So what a shepherd often had to do is he often had to take rocks and dam up the, the stream and cause that current to slow down or even stop so the sheep could have something to drink. What David is saying here again is he satisfies my needs. He brings me to a quiet place where the water is still. Remember the 19th Psalm. Regarding God's law, more to be desired are they than gold, even much fine gold. Sweeter also than honey and drippings from the honeycomb. What, what the psalmist there is saying is that God's word is so refreshing. It is so desirable, it's more valuable than any measure of money. It is tastier than the sweetest morsel of food. That is where God brings us. Even Jesus, when He was fasting and He was being tempted by Satan, and Satan says, why don't you just go ahead and turn these stones and make bread? Jesus said, man, shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of of God. And then we get to verse 3. He restores my soul. Literally, it means He brings life. He causes life to return to me. With, with these sheep often being startled, they could quickly become anxious. And the shepherd had to calm them down or else they run off. The shepherd had to take time and comfort his sheep. And what we're reading here is that God brings us this relief. God brings us this kind of peace that no one and nothing else in the world can bring. Do you remember the 32nd Psalm? I talked about it earlier. David said, when I hid my sins, I lost all my strength. I lost all my vitality. Yet when I confess to God, when God had forgiven David, David expressed such rejuvenation, such gladness, such joy, he couldn't help but shout. It's because God led him 
to the paths of righteousness. God led him to the straight paths, the good paths, what was good for him and what was pleasing to God. When David followed God, his soul was restored. That's what we read about the good shepherd. He provides, but he also protects. In verse 4, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, David transitions from the provider to the protector. It's not an easy journey, especially through these valleys. You imagine this hilly terrain and this small gap between these massive mountains, these massive hills, and their narrow paths and their slippery paths. And it's a perfect place for predators to attack its prey. And yet David is saying, even when I'm going through these valley lows where there's danger every which way, I fear no evil. I have no cause to be alarmed. Have you ever been walking down a certain street and suddenly you thought, maybe I shouldn't be here? Maybe a certain parking garage and you thought, I hope someone else is around. David said, I have every confidence in my God. See, the shepherd had a rod about two feet long that kept in their belt. And if something ever came up to attack a sheep, take out that rod like a club and strike that animal. That's probably what David did with the bear or the lion. It caused that animal to drop his sheep. But then the, the, the shepherd also had a staff, a crook, and had a hook at the end, and he'd often use it if the sheep started going astray, or if it got caught in a bush, or if it fell down. If anything happened to it and it was no longer part of the flock, he'd take that staff and he'd bring that sheep back. And David is saying, even when I'm going through this treacherous moment in my life, and I'm scared for my life, at the same time, I have no reason to fear. The Lord is the strength of all my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? David wrote in the 27th Psalm. Even surrounded by his enemies. And boy, did David have enemies. He had enemies before he was king and after he was king. He had the enemy of Goliath. He had the enemy of Saul. He even had the enemy of his own son, Absalom. David often found himself in the wilderness running. David saying, even when I'm surrounded by my enemies, God, you provide a feast. You provide a banquet. You anoint my head with oil. The idea of anointing the head with oil, in modern days, you can kind of think about cologne. This oil wasn't the kind of oil David received from Samuel when he's anointed to be king. It was almost like a perfume. That was put on heads of people, honored guests. And it was a sign of honor. I'm thankful you're here. David said, God, you give me honor. Even when my life is at risk, my cup overflows. God, your abundance knows no end. You satisfy me and then there's some despair. Again, I think about Jesus when there were these 5,000 people following him and they were hungry Jesus brought him to sit down. And he took the fish. And he took the loaves. He gave thanks. And he fed even the 5,000th person. And there was room for more. In fact, there were 12 baskets left over after he fed the 5,000. See, our God, he provides and He protects even in dangerous situations. We understand that we're God's chosen one. We're His peculiar people, His prized possession. And then we get to the last verse. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. David ends by saying God is one who promises a good life. The idea that David could continue to live and even though he would fall short, he would still understand what it means to be glad. Because God's loving kindness, because God's mercy would wrap itself around David. That even when he sinned, he could go to God and that he would be forgiven and he would experience that comfort all the days of his life. And when his life was over, it wasn't over. Because when he died, he understood that he would dwell in the house of the Lord forever. To those who follow the Good Shepherd, they experience goodness and mercy. And then even when their lives are short, they understand that there is a life to come. That they will dwell with their God forever. 
Our deaths will not separate us from God. In fact, it will unite us with our God. Nothing can separate us from the love of God. If you don't believe me, ask a man named Paul. What Paul wrote about regarding love. Romans chapter 8, verse 38. For I am sure that neither death nor life, nor angels nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. That's the 23rd Psalm. Six verses. So what are some lessons we can learn tonight from the 23rd Psalm? From the Psalm of Rest. The first lesson we learn is that we have a relationship with our God. It's not impersonal. It's not a God, if you'll do these things for me, then God, I guess I'll do these things for you. If you give me a home in heaven, God, I guess I'll attend worship. I guess I'll put money in the collection plate. I guess I'll be kind to my neighbor to the best of my ability, God. No, it's a relationship. When Jesus spoke about being the good shepherd, how he laid down his life for his sheep, he said, I know my own and my own know me. He can call us by name. Doesn't that sound like a relationship to you? A one-on-one -on -one individual relationship. A God who's more about a commitment than just a contract. He's more about that fellowship, that communion, where he says, if you abide in me, I will abide in you. The second thing we learn from the 23rd Psalm is that God alone satisfies us completely. Whether we're at death's door or we're surrounded by our enemies, God alone satisfies. The world offers us up a lot. And temporarily, it seems like the world satisfies, but it's like cotton candy. Do you remember that lesson a few weeks back on cotton candy? It tastes so sweet, but there's no substance. That's what the world provides. Whereas God provides a feast that satisfies the soul. Instead of looking to the world, we need to look after our God because He lavishes us with His grace until our cups run over. When we begin to wander, He brings us back into the fold. The third and final lesson for tonight is that we're invited to dwell with God. Can you believe that? The one who made everything, the one who made the world, the sky, the stars. He made the galaxy so far away. He made the ants so up close, microscopic. From the universe down to the atom, this Creator offers you a home with Him. It's not that He just wants to know you. He wants to be with you forever. Jesus even said He had gone to prepare a place for us. I think about the 84th Psalm, Psalm 84, verse 10, For a day in your courts is better than a thousand elsewhere. I'd rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than dwell in the tents of the wicked. But here's the thing. You won't be a doorkeeper. You won't be a butler. You won't be a waiter or a waitress. You'll be part of His family, celebrating in a place where there is no end. The only question is... Are you part of the flock of God? Do you know Christ? Understand what He's done for you. How He did lay down His life for you. How He shed His blood as the sacrifice that you should have been because of your sin. Jesus took your place so you could come to know the Good Shepherd. It's not that hard. In fact, it's quite easy. Because God is seeking us. He's looking for us. He desires us. And all we have to do is let Him find us. When He calls for us, and He's calling for each and every one of us, all we must do is respond to the call. Perhaps you are part of the flock, but you've wandered from God. You've gone lost. Well, God is still searching for you. And when He finds you, if you allow Him to find you, He will celebrate with His angels while He says, Rejoice with me, for I have found my lost sheep. If you need anything tonight, 
Understand God alone provides, He alone protects, and He alone promises you a home in heaven. All you have to do is come to Him. If you need anything at all, if you need to be baptized into Christ, become a part of the flock of God, if you are a child of God and you've wandered away, why not have a prayer tonight? There's no fear in prayer. Turn your cares, your anxieties over to God, and He will comfort you before this night is over. If you need anything at all, come now while we stand and while we sing.